Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our regular weekly message, and today's message is entitled, A Call to Excellence. Now, we're not called to live a mediocre type of life. We're called to live a life of excellence. The book of Hebrews tells us that there's a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Some are cheering us on. Some are watching. Others are hoping and praying that we trip and we stumble and we fall. So let us throw off all that hinders, all that fretters us, so that we can run the race with strength and with endurance. We have all that we need to live a life of excellence by Jesus' divine power so that we can be sure of where we're going to spend eternity. Jesus made sure that we have everything that is needed. There's nothing left out. There's nothing forgotten. There's no afterthought here. Everything is intricately planned out for our good, for us to endure to the end. So in everything you do, always, always remember eternity is looming large in front of each and every one of us. Eternity is a long, long time and eternity is so close. The return of Jesus is right here at the door. I understand that the scriptures tell us that no man know the day or the hour. And I understand that. We're not saying a day. We're not saying an hour. What we're saying is, the scripture tells us that we will know that it is at hand, even at the door. And if you listen closely, you can hear those footsteps walking up to the door, the footsteps of eternity. So make no mistake, my brothers and sisters, we are living in those last days that were prophesied by Peter. When, when he stood up, he preached that message on that first Pentecostal Sunday, the day of Pentecost. And he said, these are the last days that Joel, the prophet, spoke of. Our message this morning is entitled, A Call to Excellence. Turn with me, please, to our scripture found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This here is a call to excellence by the apostle Peter. And he, it's going up to all of the saints, all of God's saints, all of the redeemed, those who have been saved. It's a call of excellence, a call to live righteously, a call to live holy lives. The ESV, the, the uh, English Standard Version, translates it this way. Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. It says be even more diligent to make your calling an election sure, to be sure of it. Now, this calling and this election that Peter is talking about here is your own personal calling, your own personal election. That is to say, what God has called you to do, what God has called me to do. For each and every one of us are called to be an evangelist, called to spread the good news to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors. Not one of us are called to be a silent witness. We are all called to testify to the good things that God has done for us. But some are called to be evangelists all over the world. Others are called to be shepherds, pastors, while still others are called to minister right where he or she is. Some are called to go to the prisons. Others are called to go to the free. But every one of us are called to minister to those around us. But you know what? There's another calling 
that each and every one of us are called to to the same thing. It's a universal calling that is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. And this is what it says. Including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. We all have a universal calling. That is a calling to belong to Jesus Christ. And in the same way, we're all called to be saints. We're all called to be holy. In other words, we're called to live a life of excellence because we are all loved by God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever will, whoever believes in him, whoever will come to him, whoever will call upon that name of Jesus, will be saved. There will be none rejected who will come. Why? Because God so loved you and God so loved me. He so loved us that he died on a cruel Roman cross, rejected by his own people, called for his death, capital punishment by the high priest of those that he came to save. But he was willing to die on that cross to purchase our salvation so that we would not have to spend eternity in that lake of fire which burns forever and ever. And the smoke of the torment of those who go there will ascend up forever, the Bible tells us. It's not a pretty picture. It's not a place that we want to go. It's not a place of partying drinking beer and carousing because some people have this false idea a stupid idea that hell is a party place and all their friends are going to be there and when they get together they're going to be celebrating and drinking and carousing and having a good time hell is not like that hell is a place of eternal punishment the bible tells us that the smoke of their torment ascends up forever. But we don't have to go to a place like that because we have a call to keep ourselves holy, to keep ourselves free from sin so that we will have a place in God's kingdom, God's eternal kingdom. For the Lord Jesus is coming back with thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all who break his laws and all who commit ungodly deeds, the Bible tells us, on all of those who live ungodly lives, even on those who have spoken harsh words against them, hearts, harsh things against the Son of God. Read about it in Jude the brother of Jesus. Let me tell you what Jude said, Jude 16. These are grumblers, they're the complainers, the malcontents, that is, rebels, troublemakers, agitators, following their own sinful desires, sinful desires like sinful passions. They're loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But Jude encourages us not to be like that, but instead he said to remember what our Lord's apostles predicted, that in the last days there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. And it is happening right now, right today, in our time and in our day, calling it an alternative lifestyle, call it gender dysphoria. We are not called to that. We are called to live holy lives, free from all of that, that we might present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. So it should not come as a surprise now that we see these things are beginning to happen, 
Therefore, we are to separate ourselves from those whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for. We're not to partake in the things that they partake in. We're not to throw our lot in with their lot. We're not to join hands with them and join forces with them. These same people have no fear of our God. They hate him and they want everybody else to hate him as well. I want you to watch this video. Take a look. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed, as you may be, by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. He said, a lifelong atheist, not afraid to burn in hell. And he's so smirky about it as well. Absolutely no fear of God in his voice. Absolutely no fear of God shows in his face. But he doesn't even know. He don't even understand what he is saying. Hell is the most horrible most terrifying, most dreadful place you can imagine. You can't even imagine the atrocities of, of the punishment that goes on in the lake of fire or that will go on in the lake of fire because nobody's actually there until after the white throne judgment. But it'll be a place of burning with eternal fire and brimstone. The torment is so intense that it is an unbearable place to spend eternity. Yet there are those who will spend eternity in that place. Not because they didn't know, but because they choose not to go. They choose the wrong and not the right. Hell is, is a place you do not want to go and should be deathly afraid of it. I'm not saying not afraid to burn and you know what you don't have to go just like I said you do not have to go because Jesus made a way out for you he paid the price on Calvary he died so that you don't have to die that second death his death for everybody the righteous for the unrighteous the holy for the unholy. So why are people so hostile towards Jesus? I will never figure out why they hate the things of God and they hate the one who died for them. Jesus has nothing but love and compassion for each one of us. He's done nothing but love us. But there is and there will be, whether you believe, whether you don't believe, whether you want to, whether you don't want to, there will come a time, and it's not far off, when each one of us will have to stand before that same God that we either love now, either adore, or the God that we hate, that we despise. Either way, that God cannot and will not be ignored. That appointment will not and cannot be missed. But we don't have to be terrified of that day, nor do we have to be sentenced to eternal punishment on that day, because there is a better way. There is an easier way. It is not that we don't have the tools. It's not that we don't have the knowledge because we do. Peter tells us that Jesus has given us everything that pertains to life, that pertains to godliness through his divine power, which means that we have been given everything that is needed to attain life and to live holy. We have been given a call to excellence and we can receive these things 
through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is why it is so, so important. And I always, at the end of every, every uh, message, and I always tell us the importance of reading Scripture, of studying Scripture. I always encourage you, read your Bibles. Buy a Bible if you don't have one. Take it off the bookshelf if you, bookshelf if you do have one. Begin to read, begin to study, because... You need to find Jesus. You need to build up that personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's through His Word that He ministers to us. It's through His Word that He speaks to us. Listen to messages like this one so that you can be prepared for that dreadful day and not be found wanted when you're weighed in the balances. You know, as I always say, a religion is a religion of faith and relationship. It's not just relationship, but it's faith and relationship. It is a religion because without faith, we cannot have a relationship. And without a relationship, there is no salvation. Our relationship starts first and foremost with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to come to Him, first of all. And then we have that relationship with those around us. So it's a vertical and then a horizontal relationship. We must have a, a relationship with our family and fellow Christians. We must have that relationship with our friends, with neighbors, with people we work with, our acquaintances, even our enemies, those who hate and despise us. The Bible tells us that the only debt we can never pay off is the debt to love others. Love is the greatest of all the gifts and of all the fruits. Love is so great that it covers a multitude of sins. Because of the exceedingly great love that Jesus has for us, us, his bride, the true believers, he has bestowed on us his precious and very great promises so that through them we may be partakers of the divine nature. I want us to read that portion of scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. This is not to be taken lightly, nor passively brushed over. We can't just sweep this under the carpet or keep it on the back burner. I want you to please understand that when Peter said that we may be partakers of the divine nature, he is not referring to, nor is he even suggesting that we somehow become little gods ourselves. No, the creature is never invited to partake in the divine essence of the creator. God is God alone, and besides him, there is no other. He said that he will not give his glory to another, nor will he share his praise with carved idols. God is a holy God. It is him or nothing. But you know what? Even though he will not share his divinity with us, he's willing to make us his heirs and joint heirs with his son, Jesus Christ. And you can read all about that in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. This is what the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. But while we are still here on this side of eternity, we can partake in the divine nature, which makes us no longer slaves to the passions of this world. 
It is this passion, this sensual passion that Peter calls it, that is used to entice those who are barely escaping the defilement of this world. I want you to understand that when, when we're saying that divine nature, that means that we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That we can cast out demonic spirits, drive out evil and unclean spirits. That means that we can, we can speak to the darkness, that spirit of depression, that spirit of anxiety, and command it to leave in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And God himself will honor that because he has given us those great promises. See, sin and iniquity are ever crouching at the door and his desire is to have us. But God told Cain in the book of Genesis, you must rule over it and we must rule over it as well if we are going to make our election and our calling sure if we're going to make eternity with jesus our eternal home then we are to rule over sin we are to to to, to overcome sensual desires we need to confirm our eternal place in god's kingdom but in order for us to solidify our calling and election, we must overcome sin. Here's what Peter instructed us to do in order to be fruitful and to answer the call to excellence. Staying in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1, let us back up a few verses from our original scripture to verse 5. And I want to read verses 5 through 8. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. I want you to notice that Peter uses the word supplement. This word supplement means to add to, add to something so that to make it, to make up for the lack or the deficiency. As important as faith is, it sounds like just having faith Faith is not enough to succeed in fulfilling the call to excellence. Because this is what James said. James said in James chapter 2 verse 19, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So just to have faith and faith alone, not adding anything to it, is just not enough. But somebody says, well, faith isn't really important after all then, right? No, no, faith is very, very important. Because Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So faith is the foundation that we need to build our other attributes on. But it is not enough to stay at the faith alone level. In other words, you just can't limp along through life believing that there is one God. So everything is fine and dandy with me. No, no, no. You must add to that. You must supplement that, that faith with virtue if you want to move up to the next level. Now this word virtue is a word that we all know. We all use this word. But it might not be the easiest word to define. If somebody asks you, well, what is virtue? How do you define it? Well, Webster's New World Dictionary defines it this way. General moral excellence, right action and thinking, goodness or morality. It is a general moral excellence. You see somebody you don't like at all. You, 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 you despise this person. 
You see that person crossing the road. You don't speed up and claim that you never saw them. Or if you see someone drop their hard-earned pay envelope, you don't secretly pick it up and claim finders keepers. No, you pick it up and you hand it back to them. Or if you're at a place of business and the tenant gives you back too much change, that is not a blessing from the Lord. It is a test from the Lord to see what you will do with that, that cash that was given to you that is not yours. Give it back. Is that general moral excellence that makes you perform the right action with the right thinking. Now, let's read the rest of verse five. And virtue with knowledge. So this knowledge here that we're to add to virtue that Peter's referring to is not a good college education. He's not saying add college education to your virtue. Although, a good college education isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. And I would encourage everyone who is able to do it or to get one, go to college, get a college education. But this knowledge that Peter's referring to is something higher. He's referring to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. God said, those who boast, let them boast in this, that they know me, that they know their God, that they know the Almighty. That is what God calls knowledge. See, in theology, the knowledge of Jesus or the study of Jesus is referred to as Christology. It's the study of Christ. You must get to know your Lord and Savior. And the only way to do that is to study the scriptures and to meditate on them. Paul said, study to show yourselves approved. Now verse 6, and knowledge with self-control. So to, to, to knowledge, he says, add self-control or add self-discipline. See, this word self-control is the trait of resolutely controlling one's own desire, which would produce actions. It's especially those sensual desires. Remember, we just talked about sensual passions. Well, it is these same passions or these same sensual desires that are used to trip us up. Therefore, we resolutely control our passions, our desires. We make it our business to control those passions, those sensual desires. Now continuing on with verse 6. And self-control with steadfastness. So he says supplement self-control with steadfastness. Peter says now add a little consistency and mix well. Because that word has been translated patience, endurance, steadfastness. It's no coincidence that he puts it right after resistant temptation. Because James says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So we have the need of patience. We have the need of steadfastness. We have the need of endurance. So that when we have done the will of God, we may receive what is promised us. We don't, we can't just overcome one day and then the next day we're falling off the wagon. No, we need consistency. Our family should never have to worry about what side of the bed we wake up on. You know that idiom, he or she woke up on the wrong side of the bed. That should never be said about a Christian brother or a Christian sister. We need to be sure to add consistency to the whole mix. Now verse, uh, verse 6, the last part of verse 6. And steadfastness with godliness. See, this godliness is having a pious attitude, a pious behavior. You can't act like an angel one day and the next day you're acting like a devil. 
No. We got to have a godly attitude. Remember, they used to have these bracelets uh, years ago. What would Jesus do? WWGD. What would Jesus do? Well, we need to always keep that in the forefront of our mind. What would Jesus do in this situation? We must have that godly attitude. The mind of Christ, the scriptures tells us. Verse 7. And godliness with brotherly affection. Brotherly affection is the love that we have for the rest of the saints, for the other Christians, our fellow believers. Now the last part, and probably the most important, is the last section of verse 7. It says, And brotherly affection with love. Paul told the, the Corinthians that after everything else passes away, there are three things that remain. One, faith. Two, hope. And three, love. Then he goes on to say, but the greatest of these is love. After all is said and done, after all is attempted and tried, after all is considered and calculated, after all the dust settles, love comes shining through. That mountain moving love, that sin overcoming love, that capstone love still comes shining through. And actually, Paul told the Romans that love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is what binds everyone together. Love is what holds everything in its place. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. For God is love. I want us to read the last verse, verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we hold fast to these qualities that we just went over, those qualities that we just discussed, and we nurture them in such a way that they are ever increasing, then we will grow and not decrease in the things of God. Peter said that if we do these things, we will never fall, meaning our foot will never slip. The storm may be raging around us, but like the eagle, we're soaring high above the wind. We're soaring high above the rains, far above the thunder and the lightning and all the chaos of the times. We're high above it because we're soaring on eagle's wings. Not only that, but if we do these things, Peter says we will have a magnificent entrance into eternity. That is, this is what Peter said, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is Peter talking about? He's talking about a grand entrance with all the bells and all the whistles into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a tremendous and everlasting promise we have. See, the ESV says it this way. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter's talking about eternity, infinity, time without end. And this is what every Christian envisions. That's what we are living for. Eternity with Jesus Christ. That is the great hope of the church. That is what we all are striving for. To enter into glory. To hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of your Lord. Wouldn't you like to hear those words? Well done, my good and faithful servant enter in as opposed to depart from me I never knew you let me ask you would you like to have that kind of security to know that you know 
that you are saved, that you're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, you can. Just get to know Jesus as your own personal Savior. Not the preacher man's Savior, not your mama's Savior, not your grandma's Savior, but your own personal Savior. If you would like to know Jesus as your own personal Savior and have all your sins forgiven and be assured of spending eternity with Him, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for You. Help me to add all of those virtues that Brother Kenny just preached about to my life that I might live a life of excellence, that I might heed a call to excellence, that when you come back and you judge the world, I will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in to the joy of your Lord. Thank you for forgiving me. I accept your free gift. Help me live for you, Jesus. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible, buy one, take it out of storage or take it off the bookshelf if you already have one. Dust it off. Begin to read it. Buy yourself a highlighter. Highlight those verses. Memorize those verses. There's coming a time when they're going to Take these scriptures from us. Take the Bible from us. Those times are here now. It'd be like North Korea. They are not allowed to even speak the name of Jesus, much less have the scriptures. It's coming. A time is coming called the tribulation. Be prepared. Do not let it sneak up on you unprepared. Prepare by having Jesus in your heart. Knowing his word in your heart that you will not be fooled, that you cannot be fooled. Then I want you to find a Bible-believing church. Join that church. Not one of those progressive churches that anything goes and they live like the world and believe the things of the world. If it says, do not do it in Scripture, do not do it. And stay away from churches who say that the Scriptures are old-fashioned. They're out of touch. They're out of vogue. No, join one of those, thus saith the Lord. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to live. Join that church, be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in. Wouldn't you like to hear those words? Yes, we all would like to hear those words. Praise the Lord. Praise you. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us that opportunity. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. God loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.